The Book of Skulls follows four college-aged men as they travel from New England to Arizona, where they believe they will find a monastic order that has discovered the secret to immortality. The ritual, as outlined in the titular Book of Skulls, requires four participants, but for two of them to have everlasting life, the other two must die. I've read Silverberg off and on over the years. I've usually found him to have interesting science fiction ideas, while also using a writing style that's much more approachable than many of the older science fiction writers, like Arthur C. Clarke. While I've never been amazed by Silverberg, I've previously come away from his stories with an appreciation for his approach and technique. The Book of Skulls has a strong central premise, with the search for immortality being balanced against the threat of annihilation, and the reader and the characters are all aware of it from the start. How much anyone believes is another question, but everyone knows what's at risk right away. Oddly, though, the book is way more character-driven than I thought it would be, given the setup. The first half of the novel is a cross-country road trip to find the House of Skulls in Arizona, and initially, I thought it would follow in the footsteps of Chaucer's Canterbury Tales, or Hyperion by Dan Simmons, where the journey is at least as important as the promise held by the destination. For better or worse, the book does not go that route, opting instead to show us the interior lives of these young men, as they make progress toward their goal. The trip to the House of Skulls, nearly half the book, is an excuse for Silverberg to get into the minds of the four main characters before they reach the real crisis point of their relationship and of the novel. My problem with this being such a character-driven story, however, is that I don't like any of the characters. I should have seen this coming. The people who go looking for immortality are most likely not the sort of people who should live forever. As the novel progresses, and especially once it reaches the climax, I understand these characters pretty well, but I don't sympathize with any of them, since they are all bad to varying degrees. Even during the novel's first half, I found myself hoping they'd break down in Texas and I'll be cut to pieces by Leatherface. Silverberg's technique in this novel is to spend each chapter in the first-person point of view of one of the four main characters, so we come to know them reasonably well. We get to see their thoughts, especially as they focus on the possibility of either death or eternal life. Eli, who found and translated the Book of Skulls, is neurotic and lacking confidence, but he can work himself into a righteous, persuasive frenzy, which is how he convinced the others to come along. He's desperate for immortality because he thinks it will give him the time to master all the things that he has failed at up until now, and he'll be able to find the answers and fulfillment that have eluded him in the modern age. Ned, who is artistic and semi-openly queer, yearns for authentic experience, even if it results in his death, but he's shrewd and worldly enough to calculate the odds. Timothy, wealthy and bored while also being surprisingly rational, goes along to look after and mock his friends even as he harbors conflicted feelings about the possibility of immortality. On the one hand, if it even exists, he assumes it's for people like him. But on the other hand, since he sees his life already planned out for him, he dreads the monotony of his existence stretching out forever. Oliver, a pre-med student traumatized by seeing his family members die young, believes the only way his achievements can have any value is if he can escape death entirely, no matter the cost. When they reach the House of Skulls and begin the regimental life that will help them complete the ritual, the anxieties of these characters only increase. 
we and they then learn of a heretofore unmentioned aspect of the ritual. Each one of them must confess their most shameful secret at the core of their being to one of their friends. In theory, this act is meant to purge them of negative energy, but it is this event that ultimately breaks their connection and, for some of them, breaks their whole concept of themselves. It's made worse in that one character lies and then knowingly sabotages the bond between two others. While this situation makes for good drama, it also only reinforces my dislike of them, solidifying my belief that none of them should live forever. Like Ambassador Kosh says in Babylon 5, You are not ready for immortality. Is this book even science fiction? Silverberg's own introduction is pretty ambivalent as he hems and haws over what the classification of science fiction even means. I am less hesitant. There is only the suggestion of anything beyond the ordinary in this book. To my mind, this is a novel about four desperate young men who, to varying degrees, are compelled to join a cult for the same reasons that, unfortunately, many people seeking answers or meaning in their life end up joining cults. This book is more existential angst and psychological horror than it is science fiction. The characters, and by extension the novel as a whole, has a preoccupation with class and race that wears thin and makes at least half of the characters seem more one note. Since we see their thoughts, we know they aren't this shallow, but it comes up so often that it gets tiresome. Similarly, the fixation with sex gets old. Some of these topics and the language used to address them probably came across as more edgy and transgressive in 1970, but it carries a lot less power now. If you're looking for full-on science fiction from Silverberg, you should check out Tower of Glass or Downward to the Earth. If you want stories of young men searching in unconventional ways to get a sense of fulfillment and authenticity in their lives, read Fight Club or Survivor, both by Chuck Palahniuk. What are your thoughts on The Book of Skulls? Am I wrong and too harsh in my criticism? Do you think this book is science fiction? Is immortality generally a bad idea for anyone? Tell me how wrong I am down in the comments. Up next in the box of paperbacks is the high fantasy novel Red Moon and Black Mountain by Joy Chant. Thank you for taking the time to listen to my peculiar notions. If you appreciate this channel and want to support it, you know what to do. You can also take a moment to like, comment, share, or subscribe to the channel of another YouTube creator you enjoy. Until next time, read some good books, live, and be well.